Okay, so um, you are still welcome back to our channel. If you have not subscribed to uh, any of our YouTube channels, make sure you subscribe, you like, and you leave a comment. We are here at Rema Ghana where they are doing so many things. And today I have, uh, I'm at um, Adabraka, close to Adorna, where they have one of their offices there. Uh, Pastor Luko is here. Uh, he has a story. And today he's going to share his story with us. Uh, big thanks to Ash Tokin. Uh, Ash Tokin, their numbers is on the screen. So, um, Pastor Luko, you are welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I think, um, first of all, for clarity, my name is Mr. Christian Luko. Okay, so and then, and then this is a com it's a house, it's a home. Okay. So it's not just an office, it's a place where the rehabilitants live and then we have shops. So it's a complete community, a complete home of Rima Ghana at Adabraka. Mr. Loko, have have you gone through any form of rehabilitation before yourself? Uh I think uh, it precedes the question, have I ever been addicted? Yes, seriously. Yes. Addicted to what? Wow. So we come to the crux of the issue. Uh, I think um, just to delve into who I really am, my name again is Christian Loco. I'm a product of Presec and UCC. Legon. Uh, Cape Coast University and okay. Presec Legon. Odadie. Yes, yes. I'm a proud Odadie. A very proud one. And I think my my problem started from or that the presec form two when you know with friends trying to associate and be acceptable what people call peer pressure but with mine it was also born out of uh, an edge to experiment I, I was too much of an adventurist so at the end of the day I realized that I was smoking and drinking alcohol in fact beer um, and then liquors and then I was smoking weed a little cigarette but I got to realize that I, I, I couldn't stop even when I wanted to and unfortunately for me regardless of how much I wasted myself on alcohol and weed I could still excel in school, in fact, always primus. It never affected your academic performance. I should say it did. It did to a point because I should have read medicine. I should have read medicine. That was my parents' dream, and it was just easily within my grabs. But by form three, when you the science students were assiduously studying, you know, to do science, you spend more hours private studies, learning on your own. I realized that I could cheat that by reading the liberals. That's the art subjects, the humanities, because I'm an avid reader and I have a precocious memory. So it was easy for me to read, lie in bed and recapitulate, recollect exactly what I had read, even if it was a week or so later. And then it could go with my newfound style of breaking bounds to go and find we or alcohol to consume and so basically my my time for study became limited due to my newfound love for drugs marijuana and then alcohol so who actually introduced you to marijuana yes so basically it comes back to the point where i said i'm an adventurist i i really like to experiment with things and i'm a a, a very strong willed person so with regards to my um descent nascent descent into addiction i should say that it was self-imposed it was me wanting to know what is is in this i knew my friends who smoked i knew those who drank so i wholeheartedly went along with them. In fact, I used to do that without even smoking. So it got to a point when I said, look, let me try. How was it? This was. And the first day I remember, we're having entire houses, athletics. And boss, it felt so good. Because when they were seeing the jama, it was reverberating in my mind. And I was working on cloud nine. One thing which... Cloud was, nine. Yes, that's <laughs> an euphoric expression. One thing which also... Um, 
I, I should I should, should informed my continued addiction was that at that time in life I was someone who was nifty with my appetite. I couldn't eat a lot at a go, or I couldn't. I I, I sometimes I didn't feel hungry for long periods of time, but when you know marijuana, you know it's it's. It boosts a lot of things. Apart from it being Afro an aphrodisiac, sometimes it gives you huge appetite. You know, the scientific name is Delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol, which means that um, it cannot be chemically reproduced. It has to go through nine stages. That is the Delta 9 in a chemical um, setting, in a laboratory setting. Mm -hmm. And then the active ingredients, it's just cannabinol. But then they realize that it's, it has uh, um, the chemicals of uh, the tetrahydro is eight times what you can get when you take a, a, an atom of the cannabinoid. That's why you have the name cannabis. And the cannabinoid, which is the active ingredient, which makes we such a unique, exotic um, um, aphrodisiac, or should I say drug, is, is, is something which cannot be easily replicated. That is why you don't have tablets which can produce the effect, the hallucinatory effects that marijuana gives. Did you, um, let me use the word, graduated from marijuana to uh, other? You know, going to a school like Presec, I, I had to delve into things. So I knew exactly what I was doing. And I come from a background. My mom was the one who introduced family planning into this country. So I come from a home of doctors and medical personnel. That's why I told you from the start that I was supposed to have been a doctor. I grew up, you know, we're living in a doctor's village. My mom was then uh, a regional director of nurses. Wow. So I, I, I delved deep into what really cannabis, marijuana was and how it could affect and it's you know, ramifications on a person. So, apart from cannabis, did you try any other thing? Yes, along the way, as I said, I was smoking and drinking alcohol. At the alcohol, I was introduced to at home because my dad drank beer, whiskeys with his friends, and I, I was party to it. I'm a precocious person, so I like, you know, I'm a demagogic orator. I like talking, arguing. And I could take them on. I'm talking of ambassadors and doctors. I mean, no mean people. Very, very um, learned, educated people. And that was the way I honed my intellect by, you know, active debates with them. So, and they, they were they were outstanding sometimes at the depths of my analysis. Sometimes I outstanded them with the sort of... Um, logical syllogisms that sure. I could derive out of some arguments. So this went on. But then after pre-sec and then secondary school, I went to UCC and it was academic freedom. So this time I was the high priest of the profane choir. Any UCC? <laughs> so high priest of the profane choir. Yeah, that's Atlantic Hall. Yeah, the sacred choir. Uh, we, we metamorphosize um gospel christian songs into, into our show <laughs> if i sing one now you just enjoy okay do, let's do one no, 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 no. i believe i'm on air but it, it was it was a time of youthful exuberance and one one mark that i left in that regard was that in my final year when i should be writing my long essay um i think people call project yeah. i went to commonwealth and against tradition i went to take the the coveted trophy which was a phallus cotipo i won it at commonwealth in my final year just to prove a point you were still into yes I, I i was so drunk that up to now i cannot recollect exactly the things i did when we we're on legon campus we stayed there for about four days to five days and it's difficult but i remember standing in front of the UCC choir on, on the steps of the, um, what's it called? The Commonwealth Hall, yeah. where we were holding the competition. And I also remember being carried to Volta Hall by the ladies to go and give them a private rendition. That I remember. Yes. What What is that supposed to mean? Uh, you see, I was the choir master and 
I had been SU for long. So I had the songs at my fingertips. I metamorphosized the lyrics into exotic ones, profane ones. So I could give a repertoire, you know, a rendition, you know, seamlessly. So the ladies carried you to... Oh, Charlie Boss. And what happened that day? Oh, Charlie, it was like cloud nine, like I said. I mean, <laughs> I was enjoying female company and they, they, Charlie, they couldn't believe. They couldn't believe. They couldn't believe the kind of songs that were coming. Was it just songs? Yeah, basically, basically. But they were not ordinary songs. They were Methodist hymns. They were serious gospel songs. But as for the lyrics, I was sure. So how long were with you the, on with yes, the drugs? So it was after university. I felt challenged to quit marijuana. Basically because I then become a teacher, a headmaster. And where I used to go and buy the marijuana, my school boys were there. They see you? Yes. I didn't know because I was a new teacher. when That was even at Abertifi Presby Secondary. I was their English teacher. And I was introduced to the school. So obviously they had seen me on the on the stage, the assembly hall, but I couldn't tell who when whoever or who was a student. So I managed to enter the town and through assiduous search, you know, when you are an addict, there are ways you become almost like a wizard. There are ways you can tell things. You can even look at one person, look at his walk, his eyes. And then you know this guy, he smokes weed. And how then, how long will it take you? For instance, when you are taken to a, a, a new place, a new town, a place you've not been before, how long will it take you for you to be able to identify a ghetto and buy? Minutes, minutes, minutes. You don't mean it. Oh, I traveled to Tamale on my way to Wagadugu to go and enter Rima. Um, consciously, I decided that I would do a stopover in Tamale, even though I had been yeah. given the ticket to Borgatanga. We got there at night, a very rainy night. So when I came out of the bus, my sister had asked somebody to accommodate me. So the gentleman was talking of a, um, what do you call, a rest house or something. I said, oh, I'll just sleep at the station and then not to miss the bus the early morning. When he left me, I came out of the station with all my luggage. And then when I started walking on the road, it was a rainy night. I just looked at one young man. I looked at his work, which you call a galley. And I knew, and you know, the devil is evil. When I approached this young man and we started talking, he knew me all the way from Adabraka, Odona. Ah. Yes. He, he was a northerner who used to come to Accra to come and hustle. And so, you know, as for junkies, we, we, we are like a fraternity. So he knew me, he knew me from afar, but then, but the names we were mentioning, the ghetto, the pushes, I really, he really knew me. So confidently we strolled into a beer bar, into um, a wee joint, and finally into um, a ghetto where hard drugs was being sold. At this point, after university, like I was telling you, out of frustration that I, I couldn't control my addiction, to marijuana and alcohol, I wisely thought that it would be good to replace these with cocaine and heroin for the mere fact that I thought they were odorless and then they, they, their telltale signs were not easily detectable so that if I did a little cocaine, I could still go amongst my friends. And that was my, my wisdom, which was so much foolishness. So by then, right after university, I experimented with cocaine. And I should say that my first smoke got me addicted. That's the kind of power that um, these narcotic drugs have, addictive power. So I didn't know I was addicted, but after a day or two, there was general malaise. I felt ill. I felt like I had a nagging headache, um, a running tummy. And so I said, oh, let me go find myself something, some weed, alcohol. And then I went back. So it was about the third or fourth time that the brother, the friends there told me that, look, what you're experiencing is just the cold turkey. When you don't have the drugs, it, it would always put you down. You always feel sick. And so, puff, I got addicted to drugs, let's say within 
my third or fourth time and i didn't have a clue and nobody knew from my family what was really going on and so you know when you start with hard drugs you can smoke today and it can carry you a day or two sometimes three days even a week depending on your resistance your 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 strength but then the more you take in the drugs the more your appetite for the drugs increases and the the higher your threshold of what you need to get you to the first high becomes so that if today i smoke just one small snot and it makes me high after a while i will need two after a while i'll need three just to be as high as i was the first time and that is the most dangerous things about okay when you were a teacher at um, abetifi yeah. right let's go back there so you wanted to buy yeah and you saw yes so for abetifi what i did was that i moved to an Akbeteshi bar i looked at the brethren so to be crafty i bought a few shots for them and i looked at the one who was youngest and you know, well, when I said, oh, I said, oh, so where work? I said, Charlie, in your town, where he said, oh, me, there, me, no, we, I said, yeah, but Charlie, said, hey, you know, he saw me a stranger. Now people can be very, very wary of you. If you are well-dressed, well-presentable and gentlemanly looking because they believe you can be CID or whatever. But then I told him, oh, I'm the new kid on the block, the teacher at the school and as we were walking through town a few of the students were like sir sir so he his confidence grew that oh truly this is sir english teacher so he got me very close to the place pointed the place to me and then he said oh but he didn't go along with me so i also went did some 360 pretended i was you know trying to look for directions and stuff and with my nose, I could smell exactly where the we was emanating the, the odor. So I just got close and one young man came out and I said, oh, so to cut a long story short, I gave him some vibes for him to do that. Look, I'm here, I'm new in town, but I want to smoke. So that day to be very sure, he told me he's the, he, he doesn't know, but you try and help me. So he took my money, went and brought me the wrap. He didn't allow me to smoke there because he was still not comfortable. And I took it. This went on for a while until later. The students who were seeing me now confirmed to him that Charlie, the man that comes is our cell. And it was later he also told me that most of my students, they see me. So your students were aware you were smoking? Oh, bad boys company. So it was, you know, it was secret. It means you and, were and beating them. No, no. Were I'm, you that strict teacher? Were, were I you? was very strict. So what happened was that anytime I was the teacher on duty, they used to give me fans. Say, oh, say. Because they knew we were in one clique together. <laughs> and, you know, um, dr drugs, one thing that makes the hold of drugs on people strong is that um, addicts, they, they, they bond they bond, they fraternize, they share, they are caring in their own queer way. Addicts. Yes. I, I just saw one today. Yeah. Uh, two people had food. One of them didn't have food and um, they were sharing. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's what they do. And you see, that is what I would want families out there to be um, careful of. That when your children are not getting love, care, and attention at home, when you're not treating them with that sort of um, paternal or parental affection and care, they get, they try to get it outside. And addicts can be very caring, very compassionate, and they can listen. They can allow you to pour out your heart, and then they will give you their own warped, I advice, counsel. It could be good, it could be bad. But you begin to empathize, you begin to identify. So you begin to form linkages and bonds. And that is what happens amongst the addicts at the ghetto. So the ghetto now becomes a symbol of, of, of home and at the same time resistance to everything that is the norm 
for those who are coming from good homes, the ghetto is like, look, if daddy is not going to mind me, have my friend there, if mommy doesn't care about me, the pusher is there. So it then it symbolizes that. And that is why it's sometimes extremely difficult to get the youth off drugs. Are you married? Yes, I am. I, uh, how long? Um, I'm still married. My wife told me not to talk too much. My, my boy is going back to school on Sunday. He's reading... A mechanical agriculture and that's my last he's a boy he's in his second year i have two big girls who have all completed university i'm, I'm just fortunate and blessed were they aware you were into yes we are growing up they knew and they became the 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 craving desire the the impetus the driving force for me to look at them and say no i had a lot more to live for and basically, they are the ones that every day boost me to walk this road of sobriety for life. The turning point for Mr. Loku was the death of my mother. Because I'm a last born. My mom used to drive from Sunyani to come and wash my clothes in Presec. And I was that kind of person. Ah, your mom was driving all the way yes. from Sunyani yes. to Presec. Yes. Mama Ba. Uh -huh. <laughs> Extreme. And my dad too was very kind. I came from a home filled with love. Honestly, my, my pathway to addiction, I tell many people it's, it's obscure. I don't know what really pushed me there. And many men of God tell me that maybe it, it was divinely ordained so that I can also now become somebody who can be a voice for these people and also a helping hand because uh, I didn't lack anything. And I had so much care and attention, affection at home. So when I was going off, my parents couldn't even notice. It was the teachers at school, the parents of friends, and those who would meet me at odd places at odd hours, who were now reporting back home that, look, your son is like this and that. And I always used to defend those accusations by telling my mom that if I'm drinking and smoking. Do you think I always be first? Do you think I always be first? So it's one thing also that I parents should be actively engaged in the day-to-day -day activity lives of their children. They need to visit their schools. They need to get feedback from their teachers, from their headmasters. They need to scrutinize who are their friends, who they work with, who are the parents of their friends. They they need to do as much oversight as possible because just like you know the adage if a sapling is bent you you can straighten it but if a full grown tree or a branch is bent you can't in trying to straighten it you will break it so it is whilst they are growing up especially now the youth are so precocious so from the age of 12 yeah. that means from jhs from JHS, you begin to. And I believe um, it's good that those in the education circles would allow some of these children to um, have talks, sessions with people, you know, who will talk to them about the dangers of addiction, what is addiction, what good choices to make. Don't think that they are too young. To be honest with you, a child best learning years at the age of zero to five whatever you need to know in this world by the age of zero to five if you've not know you don't know it you've missed out a lot people learn whilst they are crawling and babies when we become old we just replicate what we have already ingrained in our very 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 nascent years you lost your mom was it the pain it was an indescribable excruciating pain i felt i had let her down i felt i had failed her and every day to be honest with you i'm doing this because of her memory because me per se as a person even though i can be um a little bit extrinsic i am also um innately interested i don't share things which pertain to me personally but i do this because when i reflect on the pain the anguish the sorrow that i brought to my mom i have through rima met parents who are grieving 
who are suffering because one of their children or their children are on drugs. So I've taken it upon myself to use this experiential odyssey that I went through, share it with others and let them know that there is hope. And if a Christian lion local can break the chains and the bounds of addiction. Now, I just want to clarify this point. I was not addicted only to one substance. I was addicted to marijuana. I was addicted to alcohol. And when I talk about alcohol, I'm talking about brukutu, insafufu, anything that makes a man drunk, and akpeteshi, beer, whiskey, anything that I could drink that would make me drunk as alcohol, liquor. I was addicted to, and then I was addicted to cocaine and heroin and cigarettes. And I'm talking of a space of 30 plus years. And I had the avenue and the, the access to these things. So it was not like it was off today on tomorrow. It was a daily assistance. Okay, let me ask you this. Where were you getting money to fuel your addiction? Okay, so when I started off, it was home. It was home because I could pick stuff. I could, and when I started off, the edge was not too sharp, so I could control it. But when it got to a point when um, the addiction had taken control of me, then my innate um, gift, which is my talent that God has given to me, which is, <laughs> which is. <laughs> I'm a con man par excellence. Serious con man. Of course. You don't want to know. So, so okay, okay. So, you let don't want to know. I, I, I'm interested in your conning. Oh, <laughs> conning is saying the truth in reverse. <laughs> so that you make false appear like truth, and truth looks like false. Can you share some of your conning with me? Because, Mr. Loco, Look, speaking. It looks like I know you. Were you in presec? Oh. Then you tell me, were you in Presec? No. So what school did you go to? Okay, maybe I'll tell you Addis Adel. Beautiful. Addis Adel. There was one young man. I don't know if you know him. Long Goose, Charles Afron. Oh, what year were you there? Oh, so did you meet this guy? Oh, I see. And then at that moment, I am linking you. Because I would make you know that I'm not just a new compo. The names I would call, the sort of personalities I would mention would make you know that, but who is this guy? And I keep doing it. So when I do that, I pick your interest. And then I say, oh, do you know what? I came to look for my friend here. Unfortunately, I learned his travel. And I didn't know. I had called him earlier. I told him I'll be coming. So in fact, I'm here and I'm really stranded. I have to get to Adenta. I'm not even from here. I'm from Koforidria, but I don't know. If I'm not able to go to Kofredia today, then maybe I have to go to Adenta where my auntie lives. And even I don't know her place. You so get, you I get your money. He, you would give. You would give. Don't forget my English is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you'll give. <laughs> you'll give. I speak impeccably. So you'll give. Neatly dressed. Boss. But when the drugs, this is where it gets nasty when the drugs took over now it was difficult to maintain my personal hygiene i believe these were all the things that pushed me to gain my sanity it was difficult because if you don't have the drugs in your system boss like the reggae music musician sang you you can't bath you can't wash your clothes you can't keep your personal hygiene you now live for the drugs. That's why when you see most of them, where you went, you see them so dirty, so wretched. It's not because of anything. Because the drug, it takes over your mind, your, your time, everything at your disposition. So now, whatever little money you get is for drugs. Whatever time you have available is to look for money for drugs. And then you begin to care less how you are looking, how you appear. But then regardless of how um nasty or dirty i could appear still my lingua franca would buy me out um when you got married yeah you were still in drugs yeah i got married because she was my first love we met when we we're in secondary school form two wow. and i was your been here my big brother too was your been here <laughs> so finally when it was one-on-one -on -one, i she said i've made and i said look you i'll marry you 
So I said that, and then we went our separate ways. In fact, and my big brother is a very funny person. So he also left and went his separate ways. So at the end, we met again after at Form 5. And I proposed. And she was like, whoa, the girls that you've been chasing me, I'm not going into any rat race. And God being so good, I saw her university first year when we had vacated for the first semester. I walked out of the pushes ghetto with weed smelling like perfume over me. I'd been smoking profusely for hours. So when I came out, I met her right at the roadside looking for a taxi. And my eyes were bloodshot. So she was like, hey. And she said, I'm not more canary, no care. What are you doing here? So she was from the market and said, okay, look, she wasn't leaving me here. So she picked the taxi and then she said she was going home. So she wanted to take me home. I said, no, look, I'll go to your place first because if I go home in this condition, I have wahala. And that's what usually happened. After smoking, I had to perambulate for a while for, you know, normalcy to return. So we went and one thing led to another. But um, divinely, she was ordained. She was ordained because what she's endured, even my parents called it. When I go home, they call police and they come in two V8s just to come and arrest me for coming home. So, your, your own home? Yes, my own home. My big brother is a director at the port at Takrade, and he'll call the regional police commander in Koforibia, and they will send policemen that I'm disturbing. And their excuse was that when my mom sees me, she cries a lot and her BP rises. So up till now, anytime I'm, I'm on air or radio, if it's live, people call in. If this was to be live, you see UCC guys calling and they'll be telling you how much they appreciate my wife. Do you sometimes think that your behavior caused the death of your mom? Oh, something must kill a man. Yesterday, I was with two old ladies who know very well my addiction. They are family. They are in Osu. And both of them were like, look, um, life is a journey, it's a gift. And they believe that whatever I've been through is part of my journey. The friend says, what does not kill you makes you strong. I believe if I had not gone through this um, despicable journey of addiction, I wouldn't have been a better person as I am now. Now I am more humane, more listening, more empathic, more compassionate and ready to accept people as they are. And it's also made me more ardently capable of reaching out to drug addicts who I know if I had charted the path that I had said, because my friends, boss, they would never, never roll down their, their car window to look at a junkie who is begging by the roadside there is one who is off he sits here he's always half naked unfortunately he's not here i walk with him i chat with him when i see him we walk we chat and we go and i buy him food even the food vendors have a way of looking at us because he's my mate from presec and he's off he went off from two from three marijuana and he knows me, he calls me by name. And I'm talking of 1981, 82. And he still calls me. If he comes here, I would have made your cameras to look at him. So basically, I think that in life, we have to take everything in our stride. The good and the bad and the ugly. You, you were saying you've taken your wife through a lot. Your wife had to endure a lot of things. So you got married and you were taking things from the house. Oh, her dollars, everything. So I got to a time I became persona non grata. When we want to banter, that is how we, 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 we and it, it, it enlivens us because times our kids will be sitting there and we'll be talking cryptic talk. Say, okay, oh, no, yeah. Then I'll say, go with you. And they don't know what, because <laughs> I wait, she gets into the bathroom and then her, all her siblings are in. Oklahoma, US. And she was supposed to have gone. And I said, then if you go, this marriage cannot, because I do, I didn't know how I was going to maintain and even to be able to get there. So she really sacrificed a lot. For you were stealing from her. She was my source. She was my bank of power. And she somehow, um, 
I wouldn't say actively, but she somehow um, quietly supported me in that way because she knew if there were times I couldn't get money, mm -hmm. the tendency to go somewhere else and maybe still would be great. The propensity. And this is why it is always important that we reach out to addicts. God is not a discriminator of persons. I tell you, all the addicts you met today, regardless of their estates, their despicable estate, in the eyes of God, President Nana Ado and them are weighed the same. God doesn't look at an addict and says, this is rejected. This is rejected. And this is what society does to our own detriment. We keep them at arm's length. We think they are the scum of the earth, but they come out of us. This is what America is facing. That is why they've now changed the war on drugs to um, 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 support, don't punish, because drug addicts didn't come from the womb addicted. They came out of homes, families. They form the nucleus of, they could be fathers, they are brothers, they are siblings, they are classmates. And so the best society can do is to reach out in all its ramifications and try and help them. We have to snatch them like brands from the very fire. How long have you been off drugs? Wow. We are in 2023. Wow. Ah, you see, oh, hell. My mind has gone gone into retrogressive recession. I don't remember my past that much, so I have selective amnesia. But I think I've been off for as long as I can remember, which is over 10 years now. Over 10 years? Yes. Yes, for me, it's an eternity. Because one day out of drugs, and you see, all the words I use simply is to say that life is lived in the present. We learn from the past and we hope for the future, but you live only for today. So for me, every single day is a battle which must be fought and which must be won. Do you sometimes feel like? Wow. That is the bane of every addict. We call um, some things... Uh, uh, there are some things which would, would prompt you. Sometimes when you are too happy, when you are too sad, when you are angry, these are all prompts. They, they, like they triggers. Tri that's the word I was looking for, triggers. So I have now learned to master my trigger points. My most deadliest and craziest trigger point is where we are sitting, 100 meters away from here. I don't know. Yes, have you we are... We are 100 meters away from a ghetto. Yes. And it's, it is about the biggest cartel ghetto in Ghana. Adabraka, Odona, please. So we are just 100 meters away from yes. the biggest cartel ghetto in yes. Ghana. Yes. And, and this is where Rema home. That is it. So for me to survive every day <laughs> without even thinking about what the past used to be there, oh, it is um, a fiery victory. It is a victory which is so sweet. It means you keep winning and winning every, every day. day. And every day when I step out of this gate, I don't know, somebody even waved me right now. About three, four people, but because I'm talking on the people are waving me. They know who I am. They know how far I have come. So my life is now um, a living epistle for people to look at. People. One gentleman told me yesterday that mm -hmm. people see me and they... They say how good looking I've become, but there is a price to pay. He said it in Ghana. He said, Come and quit boy. I'm an alcohol here for you for Shamele. I can see a sunny. I met Tom Nukumi. So basically, there's a price to pay. That is, you need to make up your mind. You need to take a stand. Addiction is just a disease, it's an illness. Addiction is an act that you keep repeating, which becomes a habit. And as it continues, it becomes your behavior, your character, you are identified as such. How do you say somebody is a womanizer? It's because he repeatedly goes after ladies. So you smoke today, you smoke tomorrow, you smoke 
the next day and then it becomes part of you and then you are called an addict to break that vicious cycle what you need to do is to unlearn what you have learned so today i don't do it tomorrow i won't do it the next day after tomorrow i dare not do it and so every day you are unlearning and it's actually a lifetime ailment that you need to battle addiction is akin to some of these lifetime diseases like diabetes which mostly are not treatable but are managed how does your wife feel now how does she feel now yeah. oh <laughs> when i leave you i'll be talking to her she asked me okay um she's excited she's happy i i'm not rich i've not bought her mansions or cars but she feels she's she's won a notable victory because the family society everybody they wrote me off they said this is a good for nothing man and now i've become the sinoja of eyes she's really happy and i've brought forth if you see my children eh, boss <laughs> and they are so brilliant so beautiful just like and, their father yes and then unlike their father they have none of my crazy traits i'm sure they took that one from their mom so it's a happy home it's something i will never ask god for less or for another okay mr loku i'm in the house with my children how do i identify that this my boy is smoking is into drugs thank you when people start um, deviant behaviors, alcohol, addiction, masturbation, things which are not society, societally norm accepted, you realize that they become secretive. Your son would avoid eye contact with you a lot. And in trying to avoid eye contact with you, he would also avoid contact hours with you. If you're the one who goes to work in the morning and come back in the evening, normally, any normal child would like to come, oh, daddy, this, try and pour out problems and daddy, you didn't buy me. But now your son will become a little bit reclusive. He would make sure that by the time you come, he's in his room. When you call him, he, he, he would not, he can stand at a distance and he would always pretend maybe he's not feeling too well to avoid, avoid being close with you. And then now you realize that their outings will now take on a shape. If you want him to do something at a particular time and he becomes so resistant that, no, daddy, I have to go here, I have to go here, you realize that he, he now has the edge to be going out at certain times, mostly at most times at your back, which you wouldn't know. But when you are present, he'll be bringing excuses upon excuses. He would hardly bring home his friends. Or when he brings his friends home, it's your duty to get close to them. As the two or three, five of them said, invite them to the hall. If they are sitting on the veranda, join them. Get into their conversation. And you, where do you school? Who are your parents? Where do you live? This, this. And you need to be up close, up personal. You have to be the best friend to your children. Because I told you, children are always looking for attention and affection. And if they don't get it from home, they will look for it outside. So you have to be as much involved in their lives, both for the boys and the girls, because they all have issues as much as possible. And in this age, one of the greatest um, addictions is the um, so, so, uh, social media, the phone, the phone. People are addicted to phones that it has become- and Now a betting. A betting super bet whatever bet they call it uh, the soccer bet and it's become the phones have become idols in their life and as much as possible i'm a christian you need to make sure that they go to church that they 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 place god in their lives they value god they value the the the, the doctrines of christianity and and you need to have times of prayer, quiet time. You could share a Bible verse and talk about what the verse is trying to say and then pray with them. Pray with them as much as possible in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening. 
and you yourself must as much as possible live above reproach because children become just like their parents but most times in an adverse way when they look at you they will either decide to become like you or to become exactly the opposite of you so you have to use yourself as the perfect role model what you the vice you preach you must make sure you don't leave it you have to leave the virtues you espouse to them mr local a lot of people are watching us right now yeah. they are into addiction they want to find their way to rema uh, how do we come here so, uh, because i get a lot of calls i have a son i'm into addiction i want to come to rema uh, can you um, uh, what do we need if i have a relative a friend a brother a sister what do i need so rema is actually a non-profit organization an ngo but essentially it is a rehabilitation center and rema is an acronym stands for rehabilitation of the marginalized it started off from spain by juan miguel diaz alvarez and the wife marie carmen and presently we are in over 70 countries worldwide in ghana rima um ghana has its offices the administration at dan suman dan suman um control and we share um war with aquadania me hotel that's man control very close to um i think henry's restaurant yeah so i believe the contact number for the administrator whose name is mr isaac adu is 0247 and i repeat that 0247 nine one three three that is where everybody must go for information for um you know uh, um, the requirements which are necessary needed to get someone who is addicted to be accepted in our in our homes in our structures but we have um rehabs rehab centers not only in Accra. Okay. We have a big around. One around. The big one is in Insawam, outskirts, about five kilometers at Otukojo, so that those who want to get off addiction are isolated so that they can concentrate on their rehab. So we do all this. We take alcoholics, we take drug addicts, we take recalcitrant children in Kolaboni. We take children who are going wayward and even ex-convicts. We, our motto is we, we love God and we love our neighbor. A service to God is service to mankind. So we believe that addiction is treat treatable and we do our addiction. We are faith based. We believe that the word of God, that Jesus Christ, the son of God, by his shed blood on the cross of Calvary, is able to break every chain, every bound. And so when you come to us with the word of God, with peer counseling, with um, a little, you know, um, should I say activities, which would occupy you, we slowly, because the most important thing is to unlearn your addictive habits, which has now um, become uh, an impregnable so something you cannot break so you unlearn it daily by the word of god by staying with brothers who are also going through rehab by listening to good counsel and by personally determining that you want to At the bottom line is that the person must be willing that is why even god doesn't force us against our volition you, you must be willing to. to you must be willing to break your addiction Okay, Mr. Logo, thank you so much. It's a pleasure. And, and I have you. really enjoyed this interview. Thank you. So I believe this is Hope TV. This Hope TV. This is um, Obibini TV. Obibini TV. So I also want to thank you, your channels, and I pray that um, the good Lord will continue to use you to reach out to people through your, your media avenue so that those who are suffering, such as the addicts, can have help 
can find re re recourse for whatever they are going through. And I wish you all the best. May the good Lord bless you. So, Rima is there for anyone who needs help with addiction. Rima, Ghana. You get to our place at Dansoman Control near Akwadanya Me Hotel. If you can call 0247 439133. I believe you would find the help that your soul craves for. And God richly bless you. Amen. So um, we spoke to Mr. Loko. He has a lot of experience. This interview was supposed to last for 24 hours because he has a lot to say. But um, God bless you for watching. We say a very big thank you to Ash Token. If you want any crypto, you want to invest into crypto, it is Ash Token for you. Their numbers is on the screen. God bless you for watching. And subscribe to the channel. Bye-bye. Have you heard about a crypto for the planet? Now, here's why you should get the ASH token. The ASH token is a platform for funding business initiatives that aims to eliminate pollution from the global environment. ASH token is navigated by experts whose profile and faces are known and available to you. The ASH token is not just a coin. You will be supporting eco-friendly companies to make the world green. The ASH token is backed by real companies outside the crypto ecosystem. Ash Token is registered in the United States of America, both at the federal level and also in the state of Wyoming. You can walk into any Ash Token office in the US and right here in Ghana. Sign up now, get that Ash. Ash Token is supported by GCS Fibers and GCS Ghana Limited. For inquiries, you can visit Accra Head Office, Cantonment, adjacent to the Italian Embassy, whole office inside Bayport Building, third floor, opposite the whole high court. You can call us on 0303 942 268.